Uh, one thing I did want to mention that I mentioned briefly is this text from Mark chapter 7, which is also found in uh, Matthew chapter 15. Uh, neglecting the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of, of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is korban, that is to say, given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother. Thus, invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. Remember last night, Uh, two lectures ago now, that I I mentioned this to you, the Korban rule, which the Jews believed was divine in origin. According to Tractate of Both in the Mishnah, the Jews believed that this had divine sanction. Now, why is this important? Well, I I showed up at a Catholic Answers seminar back about 1990, sometime around that area, 91, in Phoenix. And... uh, uh, the speaker was Mark Brumley, and uh, uh, I asked a question during the Q&A session. And it was based on this, because they had talked all about how, well, you know, not all traditions are bad, not all traditions are human traditions, and, and tradition can be good, and you can have divine tradition, and all the rest of this stuff. And I pointed to this text, and I pointed out the fact that Jesus teaches us here that we are to examine any tradition that is presented to us in the ultimate in the light of the ultimate authority of the word of god and we mentioned last time the parallels between this korban rule passed down outside of scripture through a religious authoritative channel and yet jesus says you examine these things in the light of scripture You subjugate them to Scripture. In fact, he says, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. Now, I don't think any of us want to hear Jesus speaking to us like that. Um, And yet, that's exactly uh, what you have in the Roman Catholic concept of tradition. Now, Rome says, yeah, but you are the innovators, We are the ancient church. All your church fathers are ours. Uh, All your bases is ours or whatever that thing was in that that, that, uh, video game. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Um, They're all ours. You're just, you're the innovators. Really? Uh, I want to give you at least a few quotes that you can uh, ponder upon uh, to recognize that that's not the case. Augustine, in his work on the unity of the church, said, the Lord Jesus himself, when he had risen from the dead, judged that his disciples were to be convinced by the testimonies of the law and the prophets and the Psalms. These are the proofs. These the foundations. These the supports for our cause. We read in the Acts of the Apostles of some who believed that they searched the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. What scriptures but the canonical scriptures of the law and prophets? To these have been added the Gospels, the Apostolical Epistles, the Acts of the Apostles, the Apocalypse of John. And so he does not say the proofs of these things are in the oral traditions. The proofs of these things are in the traditions of the church. The proofs, the foundations, the supports of our cause are what? Our inspired scripture. And that even Jesus, upon his resurrection, seeks to demonstrate the reality of his resurrection and the foundation of that from the scriptures. Uh, This is Augustine's perspective. I love what Gregory of Nyssa said in his On the Soul and Resurrection. We make the Holy Scriptures the canon and rule of every dogma. We of necessity look upon that and receive alone that which may be made conformable to the intention of those writings. Now, that does not sound like a modern Roman Catholic to me. Uh... There's always ways of trying to interpret around some of these things, but it doesn't sound like it works for me. And here again, uh, I think this is is one of the clearest ones to me. Augustine, this is from uh, 10 homilies in the first epistle of John. All things that are read from the Holy Scriptures, in order to our instruction and salvation, it behooves us to hear with earnest heed. And yet, even in regard of them, a thing which you ought especially to observe and to commit to your memory... Because that which shall make us strong against insidious errors, God has pleased to put in the scriptures, 
against which no man dares to speak who in any sort wishes to seem a Christian. When he had given himself to be handled by them, that did not suffice him. But he would also confirm by means of Scripture the heart of them that believe. For he looked forward to us who should be afterwards, seeing that in him we have nothing that we can handle, but we have that which we may read. Do you hear his argument? What he's saying is, even though he physically rises from the dead, he he allows his body to be touched and to be handled. He looks forward past the time of those disciples to our day, when we would not be able to reach out and touch Jesus the way that those initial disciples did. So what does Jesus do in that tremendous 24th chapter of the book of Luke? He opens their minds to understand the scriptures and to see that from the law and the prophets, it was necessary that the Messiah must die and must rise again and so on and so forth. And so he confirms their hearts by the scriptures. Now, it's interesting to note that Augustine had a very strong theology of the resurrected body of Christ and the fact that he physically, his physical body, he, conti- he is still the God-man, and his physical body has been removed from earth, and he even uses the language that the, the church has been deprived of his physical presence until the second coming. So he was so strong upon the fact of the incarnation and the continuing reality of the incarnation that he could talk about the fact that the church was deprived of the physical presence of Christ because Christ's physical body is in heaven until the second coming. Now, do you see why that's relevant in Roman Catholic theology? Because in Roman Catholic theology, Jesus is very physically present with the church through the concept of transubstantiation, a term that we can't even find before uh, the uh, 11th century, late 10th century, maybe the earliest. So uh, Augustine, surely, does not have that perspective at all in any way, shape, or form. Uh, But uh, unfortunately, many other people do today. Now, one other thing before we get into that subject a little bit more of the mass and things like that. One thing very quickly. I have a whole presentation on this. We just don't have time to go through it. I've got a whole debate on this subject that uh, that you could look at. But as you know, the Roman Catholic Church has a different canon of scripture uh, than we have Uh, we have the same new testament canon uh, but there are approximately 73 or 74 books of the old testament depending how you count them and uh, some of them are additions to canonical works Uh, so bell and the dragon and so on and so forth are different from the the freestanding first and second maccabees and the books of what we call the apocrypha or which they frequently call the deutero canonical books but even the use of the term deuterocanonical think about it it means second canon even that is a a recognition of a a secondary level but again uh, most evangelicals struggle with the issue of the canon and hence of additions to the canon the muslims love the fact that there are disputes about this subject um i don't have time to go to go into it um Let me recommend a tremendous book for you on this subject uh, by Roger Beckwith, not Frank Beckwith, who reverted to Roman Catholicism, but Roger Beckwith, who was an Oxford librarian. What would we like to be an Oxford librarian? Um, He wrote a book called The The Old Testament Canon of the New Testament Church. And... uh, I bought it years and years and years ago when Zondervan published it. It went out of print for a while. For a while, you'd have have to pay hundreds of dollars to get it. It's now back in print. We even carry it uh, through our website. Um, It's available in Logos. If you have the Logos Libronics library system, you can get it electronically from them. Um, Very in-depth, but very, very rich in providing you with the information that the reality is that... The old theories that there used to be two canons of the Old Testament, the Palestinian and the Alexandrian. The Palestinian was our canon of the Old Testament. 
39 books. They counted them as 22 or 24 because they would count the minor prophets as one and Lamentations as part of Jeremiah and, and things like that. Um, and then the Alexandrian canon that can, included the uh, apocryphal books, that's based upon basically looking at the Greek Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and the manuscripts we have of that as, as indicating there's two different canons. That's really no longer tenable. There was never two canons. Uh, the Alexandrian Jews and the Palestinian Jews had the same canon. The Jews never accepted these books of Scripture. They just didn't. Um, and there were uh, one man uh, listed 52 major ecclesiastical writers in the Christian church from the beginning of the church all the way down to Cardinal Cayetan, who interviewed Luther at the time of the Reformation, who all rejected the apocryphal books, including Pope Gregory the Great, uh, Jerome, Melito of Sardis, and many others. Um, So there is very good reason, uh, scripturally, uh, especially in light of Paul's statement that to the Jews have been entrusted the oracles of God. The Jews never accepted these books of scripture. These books disavow being scripture themselves. They recognize the pre-existing existence of the canon of scripture. Uh, it's, it, there's just, uh, I've done two debates on this subject. One with a man by the name of Gary Machuta, which I'm going to show you a clip of in just a moment. And one with Jerry Matatix at Boston College. And uh, there's, just, there's just a lot of information. It's, it's not the normal stuff you look at. Like I said, I have a whole presentation that would bore you to tears. Uh, unless you're you know, going to your Roman Catholic in-laws next week and they want to talk about the Apocrypha, then you'd be quite interested in it. But uh, other than that, you probably wouldn't find it overly interesting other than to take notes and hope that if you ever have to discuss it, you can find your notes. But what I wanted to show you um, was a fascinating portion of the cross-examination between myself and Gary Machuda from our debate on uh, the Apocrypha. Uh, partly because this was close to around the time when I was the biggest as a heavy weightlifter that I got. Uh, so you can sort of go, oh, okay, uh, changed a little bit. Uh, no, I was never on The Biggest Loser, uh, but uh, I, I did, uh, did drop a few pounds. But mainly so that you can listen to the kind of response Rome has to offer. Because the fact of the matter is, some of the books that they have canonized are filled with historical errors. Just filled with historical errors. And when I did not expect the kind of answer I got when I asked the question I'm going to play for you here now. I just didn't expect it. But here is a, just one section uh, from, uh, can I get that uh, centered here? Okay, let's, um, maybe if I maximize the thing, it'll center it up. Uh, At least it gave me that. There we go. Yeah, we'll see it now. So here is the cross-examination period with Gary. Now, Gary Machuda, when I got up, I I would finish speaking at the podium, and when I'd sit down and Gary would come up, they would have to tilt the cameras up because he is like about, Six foot six, about 280 or something. He's huge. I mean, I was this little, little, little guy in comparison that he is big. You can't really tell it because here, because we're sitting down. But uh, here's, here's the section with, uh, with Gary Machuda. <coughs> I started it. Come on. How do you explain the many documented historical errors in the book of Judith, such as the assertion that Nebuchadnezzar reigned in Nineveh and the placing of the building of the temple a century too early? Well, I'd respond, well, actually, let me say that. I, it always saddens me when this particular um, tactic is taken by, by believers in Christ because this is the exact same argument that non-believers will pose against Christians to prove that the Bible is not inspired. They'll point to all sorts of so-called contradictions and errors in the Bible and say, see, you can't believe in the inspired Word of God because the Word of God would not contain these errors. So... As a rule, I don't entertain such questions, and I advise Christians not to entertain such questions. The reason is biblical inerrancy is not based upon uh, going through works and trying to determine whether or not true errors exist. Rather, as uh, O.J. Brown points out in his uh, Origin of the Christian Bible, edited by Comfort, that there is, prior to that, a decision whether or not a book is inspired. 
And then from that decision follows whether or not so-called errors can be reconciled or can't be reconciled. So in answer to your question, James, I'm not going to answer your question. <laughs> well, is it not a fact, sir, that um, uh, Nebuchadnezzar did not reign in Nineveh and that we know, in fact, to the very year without question when the temple was rebuilt in Jerusalem? In Jerusalem? Well, James, yes, that is true. But reconciling what is said in that particular book to what we understand is to consider this to be an, an absolute error and not merely an apparent error. There, as you well know, there could be problems in textual transmission. There could also be tr- difficulties in, as a literary device that could be used in different literary forms. But I'm not going to try to reconcile this because, as I said, it's really begging the question. You have already determined that this book is not inspired, and then when you find an error in it, you're using it, you're saying this is a real error instead of an apparent error. Now, um, everybody who understood that, please uh, stand up. <laughs> no, I didn't get it either. But that, that was, um, uh, he's actually written an entire book uh, on the subject of the Apocrypha and why we should accept it as, um, as Scripture. So uh, that was the response to two obvious errors of the many to be found in the book of Judith. Uh, for example, having Nebuchadnezzar reigning in the wrong city and uh, placing the building of the temple 100, 100 years out of when it really was. Uh, that's the type of response that you would get to that. So the issue of the Apocrypha, lots of information on it. Get Beckwith's book, and, uh, and we'll go from there. Now, one last issue on authority, and then we'll get into the key theological issue. And that, of course, is the issue of the papacy. Again, there is so much here. Um, I honestly believe that any Protestant who does due diligence to be prepared to engage this subject simply cannot lose when it comes to the issue of the papacy. What we see today, what's fa- this, is, this is fascinating to me. Um, the, the papacy developed over time. Uh, you can see uh, men like Stephen, Bishop of Rome, who was in conflict with um, Cyprian in the middle of the third century. So the 250s. And Stephen is one of the first people we know of that starts using the Matthew 16 passage uh, in regards to his own authority. Uh, But you can tell by the response of Cyprian and Vermilion that this is a novelty, that they do not accept what Stephen is saying. Uh, They... Vermilion even mocks what Stephen is saying as, 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 a, as a total novelty and, 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 and does it in such a way that it's very clear that it is not the universal faith of the church, that the bishop of Rome is the, the head of the church. Tertullian, after he becomes a, a Montanist, uh, mocks uh, uh, the bishop of Rome as uh, the Pontifex Maximus which many, many, many years later, he uses, the Bishop of Rome uses for himself. It, that was the chief pagan priest of the Roman cult religions. And yet you can see that in Latin in the Vatican today, Pontifex Maximus. Um, the, the early church simply did not know of this idea of a universal bishop in the city of Rome. Now, the city of Rome was a very important church. Paul had written a letter there. If you know anything about what were called the apostolic sees, the apostolic churches in the ancient world, I don't think we have a, a map here, and I, I can't really pull one up right now, but you all have, we've all had them in the back of our Bibles forever, so you can sort of just envision it. If you were to look at the ancient world, and you were to think of the churches that claimed to have an apostle as their founder, you would have Jerusalem. You would have Antioch. Uh, you would have, well, Constantinople, not really, but uh, the, a number of the churches in, in Asia Minor. But if you drew a line right down the middle, 
you would have one church in the West that claimed an apostle as the founder was called an apostolic see. You'd have four, five, six in the East. It's no uh, surprise then that Western Christendom had one head and look at Eastern Orthodoxy to this day. What is their source of authority? Collegiality amongst the patriarchs of the apostolic sees because they had numerous churches in the East that claimed an apostle as their founder. And so when the Roman Empire falls, it begins to fall when Alaric the Visigoth sacks Rome during Augustine's lifetime. And it's a period of time before it finally falls completely. And when the Roman Empire in the West collapses and is now only represented by what's left in uh, Byzantium, which is now Istanbul, Constantinople, there's a huge power vacuum that is filled by what? The bishop of the church at Rome. And so you see the beginning of political power beginning to accrue to this position. But even before that, the church in Rome was one of the best-known churches. It was one of the richest churches. And so obviously, once there was one person leading it, that guy would be very, very important. And he'd probably throw his weight around. When you have smaller churches that are dependent upon you, it's pretty natural for you to develop a certain sense of authority because of that and want people to do what you want them to do, right? Well, that's exactly what happened. Now, it's interesting to note, and... and um, this is, this is really more of a modern discovery, uh, but it's not, it's really, I don't think it's disputable. There was no single bishop in Rome until about 140 AD. Up until that time, you had a plurality of elders, just as we see in the New Testament. In fact, there's, there's two models for the church in those early years. You can see in Ignatius of Antioch, the monarchical episcopate, a monarch, a single bishop, with the elders already subjugated to this office of bishop. Now, I think we can make a good argument. Have any of you ever seen the uh, Bodman Holman book on uh, the five views of church government? Well, thank you. Um, somebody around here wrote the one on the plurality of elders, which was me. And then Robert Raymond did the Presbyterian one. And we pretty much ignored everybody else and just debated each other. It was sort of funny. But, um, uh, you know, we had time to respond to other people. I think I had 3,000 words. I, I, I think it was 2,500 words. I used 2,498 in response to Robert Raymond and like 600 in response to some, some other people because they, was, they just weren't making a real challenge, but he was. So uh, the, the Presbyterians and Reformed Baptists were, were debating uh, that particular issue too. But uh, anyway, uh, you can see, for example, in Clement of Rome, Clement is one of the earliest writings, Christian writings outside the New Testament. And it's traditionally ascribed to Clement of Rome. It's anonymous. It doesn't say Clement of Rome. It's the church at Rome writing to the church at Corinth. And when you read it, if you just read it for what it really says, there is no one bishop speaking here. There is no one, there's nobody here who thinks they are a prelate, that they are the, the leader of the church. Uh, this is, Clement was probably just the secretary for the, the group of elders. And when Ignatius is going to Rome to die, and he writes his seven genuine letters, when he writes to the Romans, who does he not mention? He never mentions a bishop of the church at Rome. He mentions the bishops of all the other churches he writes to because they already had the one bishop model. But he writes to Rome, nothing about that, because he knows they don't have one bishop. They have a plurality of elders. And so this has really been established that it was about 140 AD before you finally had one of those elders elevated above the others to become the bishop of Rome. If the church understood Matthew chapter 16, the way that Rome tells us we have to understand it now, that Christ gave the keys to Peter and upon you and you alone, I'm going to build my church. And then he becomes the Bishop of Rome, or at least establishes the first Bishop of Rome, depending on which succession list you read. Um, the early church didn't understand it that way. There's no evidence that they did. They, the early church did not feel that there needed to be any kind of single bishop at the church of Rome. Uh, what's also fascinating to realize 
is that, as I said, this developed over time. It took hundreds and hundreds. There was great conflict even in 1870 at the Vatican Council when you get to the concept of infallibility. And the fact that you had the papacy split up. The papacy's history is pretty checkered. Um, if you want to see J.N.D. I think it's J.N.D. Kelly's book, the Oxford Encyclopedia of Popes, uh, just read through it sometime. Uh, it's, it's quite interesting uh, how many were, uh, were uh, made popes by uh, emperors and things like that. And, and then you had the whole period in the 9th and 10th centuries of what's called the pornocracy. That's what it's called, the pornocracy, where you had, the, I mean, the, it, it, that was the lowest level that the papacy came to. It was bought and sold. Uh, the Vat- what would be called the Vatican today was a brothel. Uh, everybody knew the Pope had all sorts of illegitimate children, and there were murderers who were popes. I mean, it was really, really, really bad. So you had the pornocracy, and then you had the rise of the great popes like Innocent III and things like that. But then you had the Babylonian captivity of the church, where, again, the papacy left Rome and went to Avignon. And it's there for a period of time, and then it splits up, and you have one pope in Rome and one pope in Avignon, and they're both anathematizing each other, and all the nations in Europe split according to which side it's, it's politically appropriate for them to be a part of, and everybody's being sent to hell by some other pope and all the rest of this stuff, and, and then the council has to get together to heal this. And all of this was in the background of what brings about the Reformation. The papacy had been severely damaged in the minds of just the people by that point in time. But it's interesting, even in all that period of development, there was constantly through, the use, through, through history the use of fraudulent documents to promote the authority of the Roman See. How many of you have ever heard of the donation of Constantine? The donation of Constantine was a document that allegedly uh, gave uh, an, an emperor, Constantine, giving the lands of the Vatican in, in Italy to the Bishop of Rome in perpetuity. Well, we now know it's a total fraud. It, 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 was, it was recognized, has been recognized as having been made up long after the time of Constantine. And yet it was vitally important in the development of the claims of the papacy. Thomas Aquinas, very, very important in his writings in giving credence to the concept of Roman primacy. And yet some studies have shown that the majority of early church quotations that he relied on and thought were real were frauds. One of the things he was deeply influenced by was the pseudo-Isidorian decretals. The pseudo-Isidorian decretals. And that's exactly what they are. They're just made up quotes from early church fathers fabricated from whole cloth. Without the pseudo-Isidorian decretals, you would not have the modern papacy. Now, every Roman Catholic historian today recognizes the donation of Constantine and the pseudo-Isidorian decretals are fake. They've been washed away by time, and yet the edifice built upon them continues to stand with no foundation. It's still there. That's what is utterly amazing to me. So you can go back in history, and uh, I think one of the, the, again, if you really want to listen to it, I think the debate with Mitch Pacwa on the papacy in New York was really, really, it it went really, really well. Um, But then if you really want to see someone fighting hard for the papacy, I mentioned earlier that I did a seven to seven and a half hour debate with Jerry Matatix on the papacy. The first night was at Denver Seminary, and the second night was at a Presbyterian church there in Denver. And the first night was the New Testament evidence. The second night was the early church evidence. And um, I honestly believe that anyone who is prepared, who's just done their homework, has access to the writings of the church fathers, you, you cannot just go toe-to-toe with the Roman Catholic. You can go far beyond that because they have to be so selective in their use of the patristic sources. There's even another debate, a a four-and-a-half-hour four-man debate from Boston College on the papacy. And in that one, I really developed what I call the Peter syndrome. 
Uh, there's a number of books that have been put out by some of these Catholic apologists over the past couple of decades, and it engages in what I call the Peter syndrome. Anything that's said about Peter in the writings of your church is exalted to the, to the heavens so that you can find a, a foundation for the papacy. Um, and in the process, you just, you just are grossly mishandling, very unfairly handling uh, the writings of, of the early church fathers. Those things, I know, I know the Boston College debate is available on, uh, on YouTube, and almost all of these are available at, at aomian.org if you want to look them up. MP3, MP4, DVD, stuff like that are available for you to take a look at. If you are put in a situation of really needing to encounter uh, this, kind of, this kind of stuff and uh, respond to it, especially if you're in the extremely difficult situation of someone in your own church uh, moving toward Roman Catholicism. It has happened. It does happen. They generally don't talk to you about it, though. Uh, everybody that I know who has become a Roman Catholic who knew me never talked to me in the process of becoming a Roman Catholic. Um, that's just the way that, that it is. That's, uh, it's the, uh, the convert syndrome. It's, it's, quite, it's quite interesting. Um, so, so keep that in mind. So there's much that can be said about the papacy, you heard, uh, remember when Pope John Paul II died, what was that, six years ago now? Was it 2005? When was that? About 2005, somewhere in there. Um, and about every Catholic apologist I ever debated ended up on Fox News over the course of those few days. Um, and what were they constantly saying? The 2,000-year-old church, the 2,000-year-old church. Whenever I hear someone talk about the 2,000-year-old church, I go, Excuse me, but can you name me one bishop at the Council of Nicaea? Council of Nicaea was when? This is, this is a date, by the way. When I taught church history, there would be certain dates I told everybody, this will be on the final. Uh, I'm sorry? 325 AD, Council of Nicaea. Council of Nicaea, the most abused council. I've had, I've had Mormons tell me, that stuff happened to the Council of Nicaea that never did. The Muslims think that the, that's when the canon of Scripture was created and, and their favorite books were kicked out and all the rest of that stuff. I wrote, a, I wrote a paper for the CRI Journal a number of years ago called What Really Happened at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, it's available online. Look it up. Uh, it would be useful to you. It's a nice brief summary to tell you what really happened and what really didn't happen at the, at the Council of Nicaea. Um, but what was I saying? <laughs> Council of Nicaea, 325, papacy, where was I going here? Oh, show me, here's my challenge. Name me one bishop at the Council of Nicaea that believed what a modern Roman Catholic believes. Just one that believed what a modern Roman Catholic believes about the papacy, about transubstantiation in the Mass, about purgatory, about the Marian dogmas. Show me one bishop at Nicaea. Because if you can't find a single bishop that believed as a modern Roman Catholic believes, how can you say you're the same church? How can you say, oh, the 2,000-year church, we've, we've believed the same thing for 2,000 years? No, you have not. That's not true. And whenever you hear people talking about, well, the early church fathers said this, the early church fathers said that. Folks, I haven't read all the early church fathers. I don't know anybody who has. Maybe some Oxford librarian has read all the early church fathers. But like I said, there are hundreds of volumes of origin haven't even been translated yet. So no one's read all of them. But I've read enough to know this. There's only one thing that I can think of that the early church fathers all agreed on. There's only one true God, monotheism. That's it. Other than that, you can find somebody who believed almost anything. So when someone says, oh, the early church fathers were all this, were all that, that person has no earthly clue what they're talking about. They've been deceived. They're not reading the early church fathers. They're reading quote books. They're reading secondary sources. They don't know what they're talking about. Because for anything, I can show you somebody who believes something else. So keep, keep that in mind when you have that kind of, uh, that kind of thing being uh, thrown at you. So when it comes to the papacy, uh, this 
obviously to the Roman Catholic, is a great comfort. That we have someone we can go to that can interpret the scriptures for us, but when was the last time any pope infallibly interpreted the scriptures? The reality is, even when the pope preaches today on a passage of scripture, very quickly there are other people disagreeing with what he said. Twice now, uh, I have debated Roman Catholic apologists on the subject of the infallibility of the Pope. And I have given clear demonstrations of where the Pope's made errors. Pope Honorius, condemned by ecumenical councils as a heretic for 400 years, every Bishop of Rome, upon becoming Pope of the Bishop of Rome, had to swear an oath whereby he anathematized Honorius, his successor, as a heretic. Do you know that? Most people don't. But it doesn't matter. Because you see, the infallibility of the Pope is unfalsifiable. It's unfalsifiable. Anytime you find a statement made by a Pope that was an error, the Roman Catholic response is, He wasn't speaking as the Pope. Well, isn't that wonderful? Then what good is infallibility? Because he may mislead you. He may teach you heresy. But it might take 200 years before they figure out, oh, he wasn't speaking as the Pope. So if you follow what he said, if you followed Honorius and you followed Honorius' monothelitism, and you you said, oh, here's the Pope speaking. I'm going to take the Roman Catholic view. And this is, this is, he's infallible, and so I'm going to follow him. As, you would have followed him into heresy. But you wouldn't have known it until after you were dead. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? What good is it? What use is infallibility when it can only be infallible in hindsight? I mean, I mean uh, when, when uh, we had lunch today, and when, uh, when we were going back toward the uh, uh, the home where I'm staying, I noticed that you had a GPS in your, in your car. And I noticed I have the same GPS and how I'm not really using it much anymore because my droid does the same thing and my droid's really cool and all the rest of that stuff. What good would a GPS be if the only guarantee they could give you is that it will give you the right directions 10 years after you ask it to? What good is that? But that's what the infallibility of the Pope is. Oh, he's infallible. But we won't really know what he said was infallible for at least 100 years. How is that comforting? I've never figured that out, but that's, what, that's part of the sales technique. Oh, we have this infallible leader. No, you don't. Uh, you're, you're pretending you do. It's a, it's a sales technique, but you really, this is not the case. And you can't call up the Pope and say, hey, uh, hey Papa, uh, we're having some, uh, some disagreements here uh, about uh, certain texts. We're wondering what you have to say. It doesn't work that way, does it? No, you go to your priest, and your priest goes to your bishop, and you have to, you know, sort of like chain of command or something like that, as if that really functions overly well either. Uh, it, it just doesn't do what it is alleged to do. And by the way, if we might just mention one thing uh, that is, I think, important, uh, just, just keep this one thing in mind, and uh, uh, I'll just throw it up on the screen here real quick. Uh, when you, if you're having a dis- discussion, and I, I just don't want to, go flying past this without, without mentioning this to you. Oh, thank you. Um, here is the, the great Petrine passage. I also say to you that you are Peter. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys, the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound, bound, heaven, uh, bound on earth, shall be bound heaven, and such, uh, on earth, so on and so forth. A couple things. Um, and this is where I, I should have had my laser up here so I could point to things for you. But I guess I'll just use the little thing here because uh, I forgot to put it up here. Uh, this is directed specifically to Peter because that is a singular. And I say to you, you, singular, are Peter. Then it says, kai epi taute te petra. And upon this rock. Not upon you as a rock, but upon this rock. Why go from direct address to reference to something else if these words are actually being addressed to Peter? I've never understood that. 
Upon this rock, I will build my church. The majority of the early church fathers did not interpret this text as Rome does today. The majority. Now, I've heard Catholic apologists say that everyone in the early church always interpreted it that way. They're just deceived. It's too easy to prove otherwise. But it is directed to Peter. It is directed to Peter. And here's the point, right? Here is a very important word. Now, I'm not going to ask Brother Barcelos to parse this because that would be mean of me and he'd never speak to me again. That's also because it's a me verb and even those of us who've taught uh, Greek for a long time don't like me verbs, do you? Aren't they? They're always thrown in at the end. They're the, they're the, they're the, the, the red-headed stepchildren of, of Greek verbs. But that's didomi. That's the future form of didomi. I will give to you. But notice what, what, for, what, 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 what tense? Future. Doso, that sigma is the sign of the future. Doso, I will give to you the keys. You see, Roman Catholics will always say, see, he's only talking to Peter. He only gave Peter the keys. Did Jesus give anybody anything in Matthew 16? It's future tense. I will give, not I am giving. I will give you. So when did this happen? I love asking, when did this happen? Because if you know the Gospel of Matthew, you know that two chapters later in Matthew 18, Jesus, speaking to the disciples as a whole, gives them the power of binding and loosing. Now, if this is where it is, then Peter receives the same power as the other disciples do, equally, no preferential treatment. Now, that's what the early church believed. The early church recognized Binding and loosing and keys, they sort of have a connection with one another. But you see, later theology distinguishes the keys, elevates them, and gives a lesser power to the other apostles because you have to have that that preeminence for Peter in Roman theology. But if it's not Matthew 18 that is the fulfillment of this future tense, then where is it? You'd actually have to say that Matthew never even records for us the fulfillment of this promise, if it's not Matthew 18, because there's no other possibility. So whenever you hear, here Jesus gives Peter the no, they're ignoring the language. Now, of course, they like to try to say, well, it wasn't in Greek anyways, it was in Aramaic, and, and it wouldn't have said uh, uh, Peter, uh, it would have said uh, uh, Kepha, and uh, as if they know exactly what an original Aramaic would have looked like. There's actually good argumentation. Chris Karagunas and others have argued that it wouldn't have been uh, kepha, that a different word would have been used instead of upon this rock. So when you, when you want to start changing from what was canonized in the Greek language to some other language and speculating on what the originals were, well, you can, you can do that all you want. It's not going to accomplish much. So keep them honest on these things. There's all sorts of New Testament evidence that demonstrates that Peter is not given some position of preeminence in the early church. Uh, He was probably the oldest of the disciples. He certainly was the most outspoken of the disciples. But you know, sometimes that got him in trouble. Remember the Mount of Transfiguration? Remember that? I always loved that. Peter, James, and John are up there on the Mount of Transfiguration. God shows up. There's the Father. There's the Son. Jesus is glowing. Here comes Moses and Elijah, the law and the prophets. And Peter's just got to open his yap. He just can't sit there and adore. He can't sit there in quietude. He's got to open his mouth and say, you know, it's great to be here. I think we should build tabernacles for each one of us. And we should just have ourselves a powwow up here. And what is Luke's comment? He didn't know what he was saying. (laughs) Now, Peter does have a preeminence there. But it's a preeminence in talking too quick and not knowing what you're saying. And he does the same thing in Matthew 16, doesn't he? Because within a few sentences of this, what does it say? Get behind me, Satan. You're not minding God's things, but man's. I'll die for you, Jesus. Yeah, cockroaches three times, you'll deny me. So yeah, I guess you could say he has a preeminence, but I'm not sure that makes him a pope, does it? Now, History says that Peter went to Rome. Really? Is that the case? 
Well, it is interesting to me that when Paul describes his relationship with Peter, what's one of the, descri- one of the descriptions he gives? They saw that I, Paul, had been entrusted with the apostleship to the Gentiles, and Peter, to whom? To the Jews. What's he doing in Rome? What's he doing in Rome? Uh, when Peter writes and he says he's in Babylon, oh, that's secret code word for, for Rome. Maybe. I'll admit it could be. Um, but you ever heard the Babylonian Talmud? There was an entire Jewish community there. And if you're the apostle to the Jews, maybe he was doing what he was supposed to do. And it does seem like quite an indictment that when Paul was in Rome and he is standing before Caesar, what does he say? Nobody stood with me. Well, I hope Peter wasn't there. Because then Peter would have the preeminence in not standing with his fellow apostle in his defense if he was in Rome. So there's all sorts of things that we can uh, that we can raise when it comes to the issue of the papacy, but time is rushing past us. We need to get to the core of the gospel presentation of Roman Catholicism. Now, how many of you are former Roman Catholics again? Okay. How many of you would say you practiced and, and you knew your th- you knew what you believed, or was it just sort of cultural? You sort of knew what you believed. All right. Not really. Okay. Uh, even if you did know what you believed, I have to, I have to go through some of this basic stuff because you've, you've got to understand where Rome is coming from. Much of this is in the textbook, obviously, because I deal with the mass and I deal with these issues there. But I think it's vitally important that we understand this is where the issue is. The issue is in the gospel. How is a person saved? In Roman Catholicism, and I again, once again, I realize there are all sorts of different interpretations here. I'm going with the dogmatic teachings. The, you know, if you had walked up to the Bishop of Rome in 1850, around the time that he promulgated the Papal Syllabus of Errors, there in the 19th century, I remember the date of the Papal Syllabus of Errors, I think it was a little later than that, but somewhere around that time period, and you had, you had asked for a summary of the faith, this is what you would have gotten. At least back then, it was a pretty clear idea of, of what was being taught. When a person sins, there are two kinds of sin. There is mortal sin and there is venial sin. Mortal sin and venial sin. Now, when a child is baptized at the font, that baptism sacramentally infuses grace into the soul of that child, forgiving them of original sin and causing them to enter into what's called the state of grace. This is the initial act of justification. The baptismal font is called the labor of regeneration. It is how regeneration initially takes place. And so when the baby or the adult convert, is baptized. Original sin, all sins are washed away, and they are justified by that sacramental infusion of grace into the soul. When I say infusion of grace into the soul, what I mean by that is that they are made objectively pleasing to God. The reason you go to heaven is because you yourself, in your soul, are pleasing to God. You have been totally cleansed. It's like you have become a beautiful bar of gold. And God likes gold, evidently. I mean, he paves the streets of heaven with it. So if you're a beautiful bar of gold, you get to go to heaven. But you've been changed and made objectively right with God. You've been made objectively pleasing to God by a change of your soul but if you've ever known some catholics 
like I've known Catholics, they don't stay cleansed. That's why they have to go to confession. Now, those of you who were former Catholics, do you remember that particular experience? Was that, uh, uh, were, were you, did you, yeah. So, so you were, you were when, when were you converted? Young 20. So, okay, so you, you went to confession a few times anyways, right? Okay, mainly as a younger person, okay. You lied in confession. Back as soon as you heard my voice, you would say, "You again, huh, Doc? Or you again, huh, Charlie? What'd you do this time?" So I would just tell a few lies and about stealing gum or whatever, and then he'd say, "Go do your thing," and I did, and we'd go outside and laugh about it. Wow. That's how long it was. Okay. It was All right. Sad. All right. So, in was it ever explained to you that by lying in that context, you were probably committing a mortal sin? I mean, that's a uh, that's pretty serious from the, uh, from the, uh, from the Roman perspective, actually. Um, but the reason you have to go to confession is you have committed sins. Now, if you have committed a mortal sin, a mortal sin destroys the grace of justification. You might want to be aware of this. I mean, that sounds like an awesome test question to me. Does a mortal sin destroy the grace of justification? That sounds sounds really good. A mortal sin destroys the grace of justification. So if you commit a mortal sin, you were justified, you were the friend of God, now you are no longer, and if you die in that state, you will go to hell. You are no longer a friend of God. You were in the state of grace, now you're out of the state of grace. All right? Now, the problem is, what sins are mortal sins? One of the reasons I asked those of you who are former Roman Catholics if you had gone to confession is you may have discovered, if you went to confession to different priests, that they didn't all agree with one another, not only as to what sins fell into what category, but as to what penances would be uh, appropriate. I mean, everybody would know that there were certain priests that were... (laughs) more lenient than other priests. And you'd try to go when the lenient priest was there and not the old crusty guy that was going to give you some huge penance for you know, spitting on the sidewalk. But the same thing is true when it comes to what amounts to a mortal sin and what isn't a mortal sin. So you don't really know. There is no, there is no objective rule that says this is a mortal sin and that is not. I, uh, I wish we had the video of this. The Catholics own it and they will not release it. But we do have the audio. Uh, in my debate with Mitchell Pacwa on justification in 1991, I set up a question and I said, Jesus said the greatest commandment was what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Surely, breaking the greatest commandment would have to be a mortal sin because breaking lesser commandments, how how can that be more serious than breaking the greatest commandment? And yet, none of us love God perfectly. So, Father Pacwa, I said, knowing that he speaks Hebrew, And knowing that he knows what shalom means. We all know what shalom means, right? It sort of means peace. But don't be deceived. That's not all it means. It means a wellness of relationship. No Jew, for example, would say that right now Israel is at peace, even if there weren't any bombs going off today. Because their tanks are on the borders, their air air force is constantly on alert, they would never say they're at peace right now because there's no wellness of relationship with their neighbors. Knowing he would know that, I said, Dr. Pacwa, how can you say that you have peace with God when you admit that you might commit a mortal sin before you go to bed tonight and go to sleep as an enemy of God? No longer a friend of God, no longer in a state of grace, You can become an enemy of God before your head hits the pillow tonight, according to your own theology. 
And he sort of gave an answer that didn't really answer the question, so I redirected. And once I redirected it very straightforwardly at him, you can listen to the recording. Like I said, I'd love to see this on video, but they won't release the videos from 1991. Well, I suppose we paid them $5,000, they would. But um, you hear him saying, well, um, I don't know. He said, I don't know. That's one of the things I've always appreciated about him because all my other opponents would have come up with some wacky response. But he at least said, I don't know. Um, And I appreciated that because that is the question. So you have this concept of mortal sins. You have to go to the priest. You commit a mortal sin. You go to the priest. You confess the sin. He sacramentally, through his sacerdotal powers, forgives the eternal punishment of your sin, but not necessarily the temporal punishment of your sin. That's why he applies penances. These are things you must do to work off the temporal punishment of your sins. Okay? Now, if you commit a non-mortal sin, a venial sin, venial sins do not destroy the grace of justification. But they do bring temporal punishments upon your soul. So the idea is, throughout your life, your baptism turns you into this beautiful brick of gold. You're now pleasing to God. But when you commit a mortal sin, you cease being a brick of gold and you're no longer pleasing to God until you're sacramentally turned back into a brick of gold by the priest and through confession. But now you're a brick of gold and you've got dung on your surface. You've got something that's repellent to God. And so what you're supposed to be doing during your life is doing your penances, your Hail Marys and your Our Fathers and your acts of charity and your pilgrimages and things like that. And that is supposed to change you to get rid of those impurities from the surface of the gold so that you will again be completely pleasing to God and enter into his presence. Same thing with the venial sins. Even if you don't commit a mortal sin, you can still end up with covered with dung if you do not do the penances you need to do to get rid of those impurities before you die. But what happens if you die and you've done all your penances so that all of the dung has been removed and you're a spotless bar of gold. What do you call that person? A saint. That's a saint. A saint is a person who is ready at the time of their death to enter directly into the presence of God. They have more merit from their penances and their good works than they have temporal punishments upon their soul. And so they do not pass go. They do not collect $200. They go straight into the presence of God. They are the saints. Now, the church doesn't claim to know for certainty all of who the saints are. The process of sainthood that you hear about all the time that's going on in regards to Mother Teresa and to John Henry Cardinal Newman and stuff like that, that's a different thing. That's where the the church on earth recognizes special people, but the church doesn't claim to have an infallible knowledge of who all the saints were. There are saints who have died that nobody you know, is ever going to know about until, until heaven. But if you're tracking with me, you're going, okay, uh, if you've got people who get rid of all of the dung on the surface of their gold, what about the people who don't? I mean, I know a lot of Catholics. <laughs> And, uh, you know, some of the cussinous, drinkinest, sinnest people on the planet, you know, uh, sober up long enough to go see the priest. You know, just go to Ireland. Uh, so what about them? Well, God is not going to bring a bar of gold covered with dung into his presence. And that's why you have Purgatory. Now, I know in the West, there are people who said, oh, they got rid of purgatory at Vatican II. No, they did not. 
Vatican II really didn't get rid of anything uh, in, any, in any formal way. Purgatory is just as much a part of Roman Catholic theology to this day. Benedict XVI, liberal that he is in many ways, has given many plenary indulgences just over the past couple of years. We'll talk about indulgences in a second. But the whole idea of the need for purgatory is found in this idea of what salvation is and this idea of what justification is, this being made objectively pleasing to God. But if you've got temporal punishments, stains, imperfections, then those have to be cleansed before you enter into the presence of God, and that's what purgatory is for. And in purgatory, you undergo what is called satispatio. Satispasio, S-A-T-I-S-P-A-S-S-I-O, satispasio, the suffering of atonement, the suffering of atonement. And I would recommend to you, if you want to see how this has been believed down through the centuries, uh, I would recommend to you a book by F.X. Shoup. F.X. Shoup might be the translator. I could be wrong about that, but it's published by Tan Books. Uh, And... It's called just Purgatory, and it's the stories and, uh, of, of, of the saints and their revelations concerning the nature of Purgatory and why you don't want to go there, basically. And you read these stories, and these saints are appearing and clothed in, in flames, and, and vision. You know, saints are taken to Purgatory, and they're shown. Uh, it's, it's all the same sufferings as hell. It's just not as long in the sense that anybody who goes to purgatory will eventually be released from purgatory. But you have the situation where you've got uh, souls over in the freezing cold, and they stay there as long as they can, and they can't stand it, and then they jump across into the flames. And then they're in the flames until they're on fire, and they jump back into the cold. And, and just all these, these, these horrific things uh, that, that are going on there. And so th- this, was, this was old-time Roman Catholicism. Now, it, it's sort of like when the New Age, when, when Eastern mysticism came into Western culture and you had reincarnation and stuff like that. What they do, what they've done is they've, they've sort of cleaned it up a little bit. And it was very, very clear in the days of Luther, that you stayed in purgatory for a particular period of time. Now they'll say, well, we've never, uh, uh, we've never dogmatically said, you know, uh, that time exists in purgatory and all the rest of that. Those of you who were Roman Catholics, have you ever heard um, of the Sabbatine privilege? You heard of the Sabbatine privilege? Do you remember what it was? This is somebody from Purgatory on a certain Saturday during Lent. Well, actually, very, very close. Exactly. The Sabbatine privilege is if you wore the brown scapular, if you wore the brown scapular, then on the Saturday after your death, Mary will come down into Purgatory and will release you from Purgatory. Now, somebody answer me a question. If there's no time in Purgatory, Purgatory, how does Mary show up on Saturday? Ever thought about that? It's so obvious that the belief, and this was a the Sabbatine privilege was promoted by Pope after Pope after Pope. It is so obvious that there was a time in Purgatory. But now it's like, well, it might be instantaneous or or, you know, like I said uh, last night, I had one Roman Catholic say, it's where God loves the hell out of you and, and you know, all this kind of stuff. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, you're just left going, wow, this is, this is absolutely amazing. Uh, but that's, that's how it works. Now, what does all this have to do with the gospel? Well, let's, let's, let, let, let's finish this up. Why is it that you can do anything for anyone in purgatory? Well... Over the years, they developed the theology that's called the Thesaurus Meritorum. Thesaurus Meritorum, or the Treasury of Merit. The Treasury of Merit. One of the medieval popes, I used to know his exact name, which number he was, but I, I, off the top of my head I can't right now. One of the popes, probably a pious or an innocent or something, 
There have been enough of them. That's a good guess. Um, said that all Christ had to do was shed one drop of blood to redeem the world. But since he bled copiously, his sacrifice creates all this excess merit. Okay? But then you have folks like Mary. And Mary lived a sinless life. And she did all these good deeds. And so when Mary dies, she has all sorts of excess merit. And when the saints die, they at least have enough merit that they don't have to en- enter into purgatory. And they might have a, a little bit of excess merit or a lot of excess merit. But since it's excess and they don't need it, all that excess merit is put into the treasury of merit. So the treasury of merit is made up of the excess merits of Jesus' death, Mary, and the saints. All jumbled together in this treasury of merit. And guess who controls the treasury of merit? The keys of Peter, the church, the papacy. Controls the treasury of merit. So what is an indulgence? Well, quite simply, an indulgence is a withdrawal from the treasury of merit and a deposit to the account of an individual. I mean, if you just want to use financial language and terminology, that's the best way to describe it. It is a transfer of excess merit from the treasury of merit to an individual who needs that excess merit. So, this leads us to what happened at the time of the Reformation and Luther's disgust at this subject. And so, after we take our break, what we will do is we will look at that and then use that as sort of the avenue through which we can go into the discussion of the priesthood and then the central aspect of all this, the concept of the mass, and see how all of this totally destroys the sufficiency of the work of Christ on the cross of Calvary. All right? So let's take our break.